Salam sejahtera. Good morning and a well, warm welcome to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and also to our speaker for today, Associate Professor Dr. Mariam Adavia Zulkifi. My name is P.W. Wong, and I am the moderator for our webinar today. Our talk today is part of a series of webinars organized by the Malaysia Productivity Corporation, or MPC, on behavioral insights and the application of its principles in policy formulation in order to achieve an effective and efficient delivery of public policies for the benefit of society. Behavioral insights is a holistic approach requiring policymakers to be sensitive and careful about human psychology when crafting policies. It emphasizes the use of better experimental designs and more compelling business cases to produce higher quality policies and regulations, which in turn can contribute to sustainable productivity and economic growth of the nation. The application of behavioral insights has been on the increase around the world and governments of many countries such as the United States, uh, United Kingdom, Australia, Singapore, and now our country, Malaysia as well, have used behavioral insights in the formulation and implementation of public policies to drive their success rate. In our talk today, titled to encourage the use of public transport in Klang Valley using behavioral insights. Our speaker, uh, Dr. Mariam, will share with us the study using behavioral insights or BI, yeah, behavioral insights in short is BI, uh, approach to encourage people to use public transport, particularly among working people. Concerns have been raised that people who own a car still prefer to drive to work in the city of Kuala Lumpur and not use public transport, in particular, urban rail services. In this study, which is a collaboration between the Malaysia Productivity Corporation and the Ministry of Transport of Malaysia, the behavioral aspects within this target group who are not using the public transport are studied so that the appropriate interventions can be proposed. So before I hand over the session to our speaker, uh, let me first introduce her. Associate Professor Dr. Mariam Adawia Zulkifli holds a Master of Science in Cognitive Science and a PhD in Psychology. She is an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology at the International Islamic University, Malaysia. Dr. Mariam's area of specialization is Cognitive Psychology, which is a field in psychology focusing on the study of mental processes. Her research interests are in the study and understanding of normal and abnormal cognitive processes, the cognitive neurofunctional anatomy related to learning and memory, the relationship between memory and aging, and also learning and cognitive competencies. Dr. Mario teaches undergraduate courses such as cognitive psychology, introduction to psychology, experimental psychology, physiological psychology, and psychology of learning. She also supervises master's and PhD students in the domain of cognitive psychology. With that, I hand over the session to Dr. Mariam. Over to you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wong, for the welcoming remark. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. And peace be upon all of you. Selamat sejahtera and good morning to all. Um, first of all, I would like to thank MPC for inviting me to its webinar series. And I'm here today to represent the team uh, to share about our research project on how to use uh, behavioral insights to encourage the use of public transport in Klang Valley. <clears throat> Right. As uh, Mr. Wong has introduced just now, uh, this is a BI case study collaboration project between MPC and MOT. So um, our team consists of uh, members from MPC, uh, led by my respected uh, leader, Mr. Go Sui Siang, assisted by Madam Evelyn. Okay, I am the technical expert. And we got so much help from uh, the MPC program manager, Puan Nuraiza. And while for uh, MOT, um, the team was led by Encik Muhammad uh, Kamal Hisham Abu Bakar. And the members are as stated, and they represent uh, the various agencies related to MOT. 
So I'm here to represent the team, okay, to share about our project. Right, just for an introduction, Klang Valley is one of the fastest uh, growing regions in Malaysia, and it is equipped with highly developed intermodal infrastructure, such as an extensive road network, an integrated rail network, airports, and other modes of public transport. And the government has spent billions of ringgit on major transport projects, okay, which include MRT, LRT, monorail, and BRT, okay, and um, as well as their maintenance costs. However, data has shown that the relative rate of public transport ridership has not grown to expectations since 2015. And according to Kuala Lumpur Structure Plan, public transports are accounted for only 20% of the total Kuala Lumpur passenger movements compared to 80% for, uh, for private transport. And every year, there is a continuing rate of increase in the new vehicle registration. And this is an indicator for preferences for private mode of transport among people in Klang Valley. So uh, the project is a, a behavioral insight case study project. And in this project, we aim to use BI approach to improve policy implementation on the use of public transport in major cities in Malaysia, especially in Klang Valley. So the main issue that we would like to investigate is why commuters do not use public transport as their preferred choice. Okay. And we would like to apply behavioral insight approach in order to encourage more people to use the public transport, particularly among working people. Okay. So concern has been raised that people who own car still prefer to drive and not use public transport, in particular, urban rail services. Okay, there are times when the office are so close to the uh, transit station, but still they prefer to use their private car. <clears throat> right. So for the sake of uh, perhaps there are audience who are not so familiar with the behavioral insight approach. Okay. So I will share a bit about behavioral insight approach. Okay. So um, the BI approach, according to uh, OECD, refers to an inductive approach to policy making that combines insights from psychology, cognitive science, and social science with empirically tested results to discover how humans actually make choices. And the idea is to push people to make better, better choices both for themselves and society while maintaining freedom of choice, okay? So the word, the word uh, that we commonly use is nudge, okay? So the idea is to nudge people to make better choices, okay? Right. So here, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit more explanation on uh, behavioral insight approach. So, as I said just now, it is an inductive approach okay, to policy making that combines insight from psychology, cognitive science, and social science with empirically tested results to discover how humans actually make choices. Okay? So, the inductive approach, uh, if I use uh, the cognitive psychology term, this comes under reasoning. Okay? So, reasoning is our cognitive process in which uh, on the basis of the available information, we are going to make conclusion, okay? So in psychology, uh, reasoning is divided into uh, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. So the behavioral insight is uh, part of the inductive reasoning, okay? So basically it means that we start with a set of observation, okay? We start with a set of observation uh, it's not just common observation, but then observation, okay, uh, that is based on data, okay? So observation based on data, which means that we observe, 
Okay, and from that observation, we do not jump into a conclusion, but then we have to base our observation on data. Okay, so this data, okay, should be tested. Okay, so th this data uh, come from emp empirically tested results. Okay, so by empirically tested result, it means that it has to use okay the result that comes from the empirical or scientific research methods. Okay, so in psychology, if we talk about the empirical or scientific research method, it will refer to uh, uh, several methods. For example, okay, if you are focusing on quantitative data, you can actually conduct a study using mm -hmm. survey, you can conduct experiments for you to collect data. Okay, so if you are focusing on qualitative data, you can also start by uh, using the method called interview. Okay, so whether it is quantitative or qualitative, okay, you have to use certain methods that will allow you to have what we call evidence-based data. And it is from that data that we are going to confirm our observation and lead to a few more steps. Okay, so I can say that uh, that is what we do actually okay, in behavioral insight. All right, uh, another principle or another area uh, under behavioral insight approach is the idea of Naji. Okay, so the idea is to push people to make better choices both for themselves and society while maintaining freedom of choice. Okay, so if I may share that, um, there are some major pressures okay, that allows us or that drive the change in behavior. Okay, um, the first pressure is regulative pressure. Okay, this means we, um, we would like to change people's behavior by setting regulations. Okay, by setting rules so that okay, people will be obliged to comply. Okay, they would say that, well, I have to comply to this one, otherwise I will be punished. Okay, so that is one type of pressure that will allow people to change their behavior. Okay, so that is regulative pressure. Uh, the second one is normative pressure. Okay, uh, it means that we set it as a norm for people to behave in a certain way, okay? So uh, people will say to themselves, oh, I have to, I ought to, okay? I ought to do this because in the society, everyone else is doing, okay? So by nature, we are social human being. So sometimes we, we would like to be in group. We do not want to be left outside of the group, okay? So when other people are doing it, so it means that we have to some sort of like it's a pressure for us to also follow the others. Okay, right. And um, another type of pressure is known as cognitive pressure. Okay, here it means that we would like to um, push people to change for a desirable action, okay, using the cognitive processes, which is going to end up for them to say, uh, I want to change not because of the regulation. I want to change not because of the society or the norms, but I want to change because I know, okay? I understand why I have to change and then I value the information, okay? So it means that uh, information should be very important to allow people to understand uh, why they have to change, okay? So if we allow people to understand why they have to change, okay, so later on, we are going to some sort of like, yes, I want to change, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, relating to our situation now, okay, I guess uh, uh, our situation related to, uh, apa? related to actions to combat uh, the pandemic, okay. I think the government, Malaysian government now, is, uh, is actually uh, using regulative pressure, okay, because okay, whoever is not following the SOP uh, will be punished, okay, because that is uh, 
there is a way to make people feel uh, it's obliged okay, for them to comply. Okay? The government is also using the normative pressure okay, because nowadays it is becoming a norm to us uh, to do hand sanitizing. It's uh, becoming a norm, the society norm to wear face masks at least. Okay, uh, so I think uh, uh, again and again, we have been reminded when we go out, okay, we have to do this. We have to follow the SOP. So that is a kind of normative pressure. Okay, and I guess we also have to put effort. Okay, the government also should, uh, should go for another type of pressure. Okay, that is cognitive pressure. Okay, because uh, if I'm not mistaken, I read somewhere that <clears throat> people some nowadays, okay, in our current situation, people uh, follow the SOP, okay, uh, just because they, they, they would like to avoid the compound, okay. So when the people in charge say, for example, uh, when there is no police, okay, then they do not follow the SOP, okay. So that shows that the cognitive pressure is still not there. So uh, we also have to some sort of like put effort, okay, to let people to understand why they have to follow the SOP. So that is a type of cognitive pressure, okay. Um, this one, okay, I got it from OECD website, okay. You can also check the website and you are going to uh, see the various examples of using behavioral insight. Okay, uh, that has been practiced all over the world. Okay, so this one um, really attract my attention. So that's the reason um, I would like to share with all. Okay, so this is a case study uh, conducted by the government um, the, the, at Costa Rica. Okay, so the government wanted the citizens to reduce water consumption. Okay. And the behavioral insight approach that they use is they use social norms as well as plan making because this uh, can be expected to provide effective nudges to motivate people to save water. Okay, so what they did is they modified the customer water bills, okay, in one of the three ways. The first one compare the customer's consumption with the neighborhood average and give a happy face or a frowning face rating. The second did the same thing, but using the city-wide average. The third asked customers to write their water consumption on a provided postcard that included the city average and to check off any of the six steps, any of the six tips to reduce water consumption okay and the result shows that okay um, the neighborhood comparison and postcard group registered a four percent to five percent reduction in the water use okay so this is an interesting example for me of applying behavioral insight approach okay to ask people to save water right um, in using behavioral insight approach, okay, we have to go through uh, several steps. Okay, the first one is identifying what is the problem, what is the problem that we would like to investigate. Okay, and usually when we conduct research, uh, the more specific the problem is, the better for us. Okay. The second step is identifying who will be the target groups, okay, and then which behavior needs changing. And next, we develop intervention and we test and implement. Okay, All right. So now coming to our project, okay. So the problem that we would like to investigate is. Um, Commuters do not use public transport as their preferred choice. Okay, uh, Ministry of Transport targets to achieve increase in model share of public transportation of 40% by 2030. 
Okay. Currently, it is estimated that only 19.6% of people use public transport. Okay. It does not mean that nobody use public transport. Okay, there are people who use public transport, but still, okay, the percentage of people who use public transport is not as what the government expect. Okay, so we would like to understand why. Okay, we would like to understand why commuters do not use public transport as their preferred choice. Okay, they still use. Okay, even though just I, I said earlier on. Okay. Uh, everything is so close okay to them the transit station okay uh, upper, uh, what all the other facilities are okay okay but still they, they do not take okay the public transport as their preferred choice okay and we come to know that there are uh, several contributing factors to the slow increase in the use of public transport among commuters. Okay, and um, some of the uh, reasons are stated down here. Okay, um, everyone uh, is also really prefer to use e-hailing. Okay, because of its convenience services. Okay, door to door services. There are also some who who are not willing to try public transport. Okay, so regardless of. Uh, with the, so many positive reasons of using public transport, still they are not willing to try public transport. Okay, and uh, people also have their own perception. Okay, toward the safety, punctuality, as well as convenience of using public transport. Okay, high peak hour ridership, uh, potential transmission of communicable diseases through the use of public transport. Okay, such as COVID-19 infection, as well as lack of connectivity. And this is especially for first mile and last mile connection. Okay. So if we are not addressing these problems, okay, the implication will be there will be no significant increase on mode share. There will be poor uh, return of investment Okay, and then increase in the cost of maintaining the infrastructure. Okay, and it, it will not be good to our environment because it will increase in carbon emission. Okay, so something needs to be done. Okay, so uh, we have to continue to put effort, okay, to encourage people to take public transport as their preferred choice. Right. Uh, the scope of uh, our study, okay, first we would like to analyze the current reasons why commuters have no or lack of preference to use public transport. Okay, we would like to identify what are the behavioral gaps, issues and challenges faced by public transport commuters. And we would like to identify potential behaviors of working people who drive to workplace with regard to their perception in using public transport. And last, uh, we would like to recommend action plan, including, including application of behavioral insight interventions that can be used to encourage the use of public transport. Okay. <clears throat> right. Our target group, Okay, we are targeting working age people who commute to work. Okay, so in our scope, we would like to uh, include uh, current users, which means that current users of public transport, as well as potential users of public transport. So with the potential users, um, it refers to the non-public transport users, which means that Currently, they are not using public transports. Okay, so they drive to work and whose workplace is nearby the urban rail transit. Okay, right. Um, where, okay, uh, we would like to focus on urban people, okay, because our scope or our focus is on urban rail, in particular the KLCC Urban Rail Transit Station, because this is one of the most traffic congested area situated in the uh, KL and large working age population commuting to work, okay? Because everything is actually there, okay? 
the title is public transport. Okay, so general. And uh, with the time given to us, okay, we are not able to focus on um, so many types of public transport. Okay, so that's the reason why we have to zoom in, okay, and just focus on uh, people who use urban rail. Okay, so this is a type of public transport. All right. For the research methodology, okay, in this project, we have conducted two studies. Okay, so study one is our baseline study for the purpose of collecting baseline data. Okay, and this is also known as a pre intervention study. Okay, right, the data that we have from our study one becomes the basis for us to design and develop interventions that we test in study two. Okay, so that's the relationship between study one and study two. Okay, so the first one provide us baseline data. Okay, because we cannot just rely on the literature review. We cannot just rely on our assumption. Okay, so we have to go to the field to really uh, ask to really get the data from our target group. Okay, and from that data, then we uh, we base our intervention based on that data. Okay, right. Um, so our study one, our first study was conducted to provide basis or background to the issue under investigation. We started with the review of the available evidences to identify the behavioral drivers, okay, uh, to identify the problem, okay. Um, in addition to review of literatures, uh, the behavioral profile of users of public transport was studied uh, via an online survey, which means that for study one, our baseline study uh, involved using an online survey. And the survey is for the purpose of understanding the perception on the use of real public transport, such as LRT, MRT, KTM commuter, monorail, and e airport rails. And this is for the purpose of developing a behavioral profile of our target sample, uh, who refer to people who are working around KLCC station, who might be using public transport, and those who drive to their workplace in that their perception uh, on the use of non-users of, on the use and non-use of real public transport is understood. Okay, So in our first study, the respondents were employees from four organizations which are in proximity to KLCC Urban Rail Transit. Okay, so the organizations that were approached are Petronas, RRI, Public Bank, and Maxis. Okay, the respondent, the total respondents were 337 respondents. Okay, and in this online survey, it consists of three parts with a total of 26 questions that only require for the respondents quick responses and can be completed less than 15 minutes. Okay, We conducted the survey from August 6 uh, for, for basically one month Okay, in August 2020. Right. Now I will share with you the findings from our study one. Okay. So the first part, okay, this is about the perception of our respondents uh, towards real public transport. Okay. So our analysis have shown that almost half of the respondents, okay, that is 49.6%, are highly satisfied with the real public transport in Klang Valley area. Only about 50% of the respondents are not satisfied with the service. Um, this is about the percentage okay, of the preferences to opt for public transport if adequate information on the schedule of the real public transport is available. Okay, and this one 
is the chai part for the percentage of the preference for public transport if adequate information on the routes of the real public transport is available. And the finding shows that a very high percentage of respondents indicated that they would opt okay, or they would choose public transport if adequate information on the schedule as well as routes of the real public transport is available. Okay. In terms of the sources of information, uh, on relate, uh, the information related to real public transport, okay, our respondent shows that websites such as MyRapid and other apps have been chosen as the most referred source of information on public transport. Right, um, too many people during peak hours, waiting time too long, and unreliable schedule of trains are the three most cited reasons for not using public transport, okay? And then the finding shows that majority of the respondents, that is 68%, have people around them who mostly prefer driving to their workplace. However, 79% of the respondents said that say that would not influence their decision to opt for public transport. Okay, so uh, this one finding is actually a very positive indicator. Okay, because it shows that even though, say, for example, uh, they have people around them, their office mates all drive to their workplace. Okay, but it shows that uh, quite a high percentage of the respondents say that that would not influence their decision to opt for public transport. Okay, so there is a possibility for the respondents to change, okay, to take public transport as their preferred choice. Okay, right. In our survey also, uh, we have questions or we have items related to uh, asking our respondents' perception on the facilities related to public transport, okay? In terms of whether the facilities related to public transport are adequate or not, okay, majority of our respondents say that, yes, they are mm -hmm. adequate, okay? So, in terms of the um, aspects of facilities, okay, we ask about the safety, we ask about the cost, we ask about the convenience of using public transport as well as comfort, okay. Um, the respondents uh, chose for safety, for safety reason, they would choose e-hailing. To save the cost, they would choose connecting bus, okay. This is what, well, is expected actually. For convenience as well as comfort, again, they choose e-hailing. Right. Okay. And the last part of our uh, online survey consists of um, some sort of like open ended question. Okay. Because we ask them to indicate, okay, uh, to indicate their suggestion or to indicate what they want. Okay. Uh, what they want from the transit station to their workplace. Okay. So we have compiled that they have given us many suggestions of facilities, okay? For example, rented cars, okay? Some also ask us to prepare buggy cars. Some ask us to prepare more uh, parking space, okay? Uh, some suggest on uh, an improvement in connection, okay? Uh, reliable, on time, and with more information, okay? Cheaper cost of using public transport, okay? Some also suggest to us to provide uh, facilities related to food, okay, air condition walkways on the various reasons given by our respondents. Right. Uh, the last part of the our online survey just uh, include okay the demography uh, information of our respondents. So I will not elaborate on all this, okay. But uh, I guess from directly seeing this chart, you can some sort of like get some ideas on uh, what are the demography information of our respondents. Okay. Right. So uh, 
some highlights of the findings in study one. Okay, uh, almost half of respondents are highly satisfied. A very high percentage of respondents indicated they would opt for public transport if adequate information on the schedules, as well as routes of the public transport is made available to them. Um, they prefer to use website. Okay, waiting time too long and unreliable schedule of trains are among the two most cited uh, reasons for not using public transport. Majority of the respondents have people around them who mostly prefer driving to their workplace. However, 79% um, of the respondents said that would not influence their decision to opt for public transport. The highest level of satisfaction to public connecting buses in terms of cost. Okay, but low level of satisfaction in terms of safety, comfort, and convenience of journey. And suggestions of improvement provided by respondents include uh, to prepare a reliable, on-time, uh, adequate way finding, and more information regarding public transports. Notification from apps or website to check status on the trains during peak hours and incentive for using public transport. Okay, right. So uh, the findings from study one shows that people are generally satisfied with the real public transport services and the related facilities offered by the stakeholders. So we believe that if this level of satisfaction is increased, okay, the likelihood to see changes in the behavior to have public transport as the preferred choice is also increased. Okay? Mechanisms that have the potential to increase the users and non-users level of satisfaction and enhance their intention and motivation to use public transport should be focused on, on this, when we design the intervention. Okay, So the findings from study one will lead to our study two. Okay, right. So we were guided by this TPB, Theory of Planned Behavior, okay? Because for a behavior, according to this theory, for a behavior to occur, okay, the, the, uh, the basis for this behavior to occur is the intention, okay? And the intention can be influenced by three other components, okay? Our attitude, the subjective norm, as well as the perceived behavioral control. Okay, right. Uh, I have shown you uh, these suggestions, but now I show it again because I would like to see, I would like to show, okay, that uh, the basis for our intervention come from all this, okay? So when we compile all the suggestion, okay, uh, we propose to design intervention that focus on improving information dissemination. So this is one of our focus, okay, in designing our intervention, okay. So uh, coming to this one, reliable on time and with more information, signboard or apps notification or a website notification to check the status of the train, design and adequate signage or wayfinding, okay live schedule of rain displayed outside of the station, okay? So we compile these, all the suggestions highlighted in green, okay? So we conclude that this has something to do with the information dis dissemination, information regarding the schedule, the routes, okay? The facilities must be improved. So this is one focus, okay? While the suggestions, okay, highlighted in yellow here, we conclude, okay, as these suggestions, okay, have something to do with the incentive, okay. So we focus on these two, okay, when we uh, design our intervention, okay. So we propose to design intervention that focus on first improving the information dissemination as well as incentive okay, among people who can be the public transport potential users as well as the current non-users. Okay. The design of the intervention is adapted from a study conducted in Copenhagen as reported in one journal article. 
Okay. So now let's go to the to our second study. Okay. Um, so overall, uh, the design for our study. Okay. It is uh, first of all. Okay. It 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 consists of three main steps. Okay. Um, we have a pre-intervention measurement. Okay. Then followed by uh, the intervention. Okay. And then again, we will do what we call post-intervention me measurement. Okay. Uh, and for the intervention, we have three types of intervention. Okay. So overall, this is our design. Okay. This design okay, is actually what in academic term, we call it as a mix of within and between group experimental design. Okay, so with the experimental design, we have to have independent variables. Okay, uh, the independent variables refer to the variables that we change or that we manipulate. Okay, so uh, the effect of what we manipulate in the independent variable will be seen in the dependent variable, okay? So this is, uh, I'm sorry if I'm using technical term, okay? This is academic term. So the dependent variable is the intention and motivation to use public transport measured via a few items in the post-intervention survey, okay? So the within group experimental design, also known as the pre-post measurement involved measuring the respondent's intention to change the behavior before and after the intervention, while a between group experimental design involved the measurement of the intention to change following different types of intervention. Okay, right. Uh, in this, uh, the measurement required the participants to fill up an online survey, which is designed to measure their current level of satisfaction to the public transport and their intention to change. For the intervention phase, respondents were randomly linked to three different types of interventions. All respondents will, will then link the post, will then link to the post intervention survey. And in this post-intervention survey, their level of satisfaction to the public transport and intention to change were once again measured in order to see the effects following the exposure to different interventions. Okay, right. Okay. So, as I said just now, for the intervention, because for the, the intervention, we have three types of intervention, okay? So we have created three separate surveillance and each of the surveillance represent one case scenario as the intervention, okay? No clue or indicator was stated on the link, okay? Because uh, we assess the respondents via emails, okay? So when we send to them the email, okay, so our uh, our information uh, about what the study is all about, okay, the informed consent, everything is in that email. So on that email as well, we provide the link, okay, and there is no clue or indicator was stated on the link, okay, only researchers know which survey link represent which case scenario. The survey links were attached in the invitation emails to respondents and they were asked to click any one link and thus they were randomly grouped into three sample size and each sample size received only one case scenario, okay? So this fulfilled the RCT, the RCT component that is assigning our respondents randomly into different experimental groups, okay? The within group design requires the measurement of the respondent responses before and after intervention, regardless of the type of intervention that they receive. So in this type of design, instead of dividing respondents into experimental and control groups, 
all respondents were exposed to measurement before and after the interventions. And an advantage of this type of design is it can help to reduce errors associated with individual differences. Okay, because we are focusing on the same respondents. Okay, right. The between group design is used for the purpose of measuring the effectiveness of each type of intervention. Um, due to the pandemic, okay, we were not able to conduct field experiment. Okay, and for the purpose of minimizing hassles with respondents because respondents might lose interest to participate if they need to go through many steps and procedures. Okay, we have done necessary adjustment to the way we randomly group our respondents. Okay, right. Uh, this is another details of our second study in terms of sampling. Okay, who are uh, the, what are the inclusion criteria for our respondents? Okay. How do we determine our sampling size? Okay, and our sam uh, our sample. Okay, the finalized total of sample for our second study is one four three respondents. Okay, so these one four three respondents were uh, they are employees from six organizations which are in proximity to KLCC Urban Rail Transit. Um, that include Petronas, RRI, Public Bank, Maxis, Pemodalan National Berhad, and Tabung Haji. Okay, right. Uh, our online survey consists of three parts with a total of 19 self-developed questions um, that aim to measure the respondents' intention and motivation to use public transport, the level of satisfaction with the current public transport, the likelihood to use public transport in future, the possibility to recommend others okay, to use public transport in future and the effectiveness of the intervention. Okay, I guess I have to be a bit quicker. Okay, right. Um, our intervention consists of a hypothetical case scenarios. Okay, so we use this as our intervention tool, which is actually common in examining processes and changes in organizational settings. Okay. So what we did is that respondents were hypothetically exposed to different case scenarios and their level of satisfaction, okay, level of satisfaction, the likelihood, the possibility to recommend to others, okay, were measured before and after they were hypothetically exposed to a particular intervention. Okay, right. So these are the three interventions, the hypothetical uh, case scenarios. Okay, to cut it short, our first case scenarios, okay, we allow them to uh, respond to imagine, okay, whether they would like, uh, whether they, what would happen if they were given customized timetable to plan their journey, okay. In case scenario two, okay, it is a hypothetical scenario that will allow respondent to respond to the likelihood to use public transport if they were given customized timetable and okay, a free monthly travel card to plan their journey. And our third scenario is focusing just on incentive. Okay, so whether they would like to respond okay, to the likelihood to use public transport if they were given a free monthly travel card to plan their journey. Okay, so in the survey, it looks like this. Okay, so this is what we did. This is what we include in our online survey. Okay, remember just now I mentioned that respondent will click only one link. So when they click one link, they will be directed, okay, to any one of these case scenario, okay. So the first one is just uh, about customized timetable that they can use to plan their journey, okay. So if this customized timetable is followed, okay, because this customized timetable, it means that the respondents will be able to set, okay, the type of public transport that they want to use, Okay, the estimated time of departure, time of arrival, everything. Okay, so this customized timetable, if you follow, will allow you to reach your workplace at your expected time. Okay, 
for the second one, it is a combination of customized timetable as well as incentive. Okay, and the third case scenario is just incentive. Okay, without any customized timetable. Okay, right. So the finding shows that majority of the respondents have the intention and motivation to use public transport. Okay, and then when we compare the level of satisfaction before intervention and post intervention, okay, we have found that the respondents level of satisfaction with the current public transport increase, okay, from 50.3% to 78.3% after being exposed to intervention. The respondents' likelihood to use public transport also increased from 71.3% to 76.9% after being exposed to intervention. Okay. Similarly, majority of respondents were more likely to recommend others to use public transport in the future after being exposed to intervention and this is an increase of 12.6%. Okay, right. Um, when we compare the three types of intervention, the respondents intention to use public transport increase after being exposed to all the three types of intervention with the highest percentage results from the third type of intervention that is the free incentive, the free monthly travel guide. Their motivation to use public transport also increase after being exposed to all three types of intervention with the highest percentage result from the third type of intervention that is free monthly travel card. Okay. So as their level of satisfaction. Okay. So this one is before the intervention, before they were exposed to the hypothetical uh, case scenarios. And this is their level of satisfaction after, okay, they were exposed to the hypothetical case scenarios. Okay. This is in terms of their likelihood. Okay. 76.5% of the respondents were found to be more likely to use public transport in future. Okay. And whether they would like to recommend to others or not to use public transport, okay, it also showed a similar pattern, okay, an increased pattern of percentage to all the three types of intervention with the highest change of percentage, okay, that is an increase of 33.3% result from the first type of intervention, okay, right. So all the interventions that were introduced in this research have been found to have effects, okay, because levels, respondents' level of satisfaction with the current public transport and their likelihood increase after being exposed to intervention, okay. Um, so with this, okay, we can conclude that the most effective type of intervention to encourage people to use public transport is a combination of customized timetable and free monthly travel card. Okay, I will skip this one because this is just highlighting uh, the findings. Right, so quickly, uh, this is about the demography information for our, of our respondents. Okay, right. We come to conclusion. The findings from study one indicate that almost half of the respondents have high level of satisfaction with the real public transports available in Klang Valley area. And the finding in study two shows that majority of the respondents have the intention and motivation to use public transport. And interestingly, even though majority of the respondents have people around them who mostly prefer driving to their workplace, that would not influence their decision to opt for public transport. Okay. It is thus important to look for ways to strengthen the intention as the stronger the intention to change the behavior, the more likely the intended behavior to be performed. So the findings can be interpreted to reflect how crucial it is a reliable information of public transport, such as schedules of departure, estimated time, estimated travel time, expected time of arrival, fares and rest to be made available to publics. Incentives to encourage people to use public transport is also important. And such incentives may not only come from the government 
and allocated for certain category of societal members only. Employers may also play a role in providing their employees such incentives so as to encourage their employees to use public transport to their workplace. Thus, okay, we suggest that information on public transport must be improved and improvised so that people can rely on. Okay, together with the support in terms of providing incentives such as subsidized travel card can be a very good nudge to influence people to shift their behavior from driving to using public transport. Okay, so uh, among the recommendations for policy change is to develop a more reliable mechanism for availability and accessibility of information regarding to our public transports, not necessary to rail uh, transport only. Okay, to introduce more incentives and subsidized fares for users of public transport. And last but not least, okay, uh, to conduct and collect more evidence-based findings related to users and potential users' attitudes and behaviors towards public transport. Okay, right. Uh, the biggest limitation for us is actually the pandemic. Okay, uh, we were quite unfortunate because we got this project. Okay, at the start of the pandemic uh, season. Okay. Uh, with this, it really restricts us to conduct uh, field research, okay? And it also uh, does not allow us to include, okay, more study site as well as respondent, okay? And we also believe that uh, the study duration is not long enough to influence habit formation because in less than a month, okay, uh, to a certain extent, uh, I believe that uh, we are not able to some sort of, like see a big change in the behavior. Okay, uh, and then in addition to uh, a lot of restriction, okay, due to COVID nineteen pandemic that really discourage people to use uh, public transport. Okay, however, uh, the findings and lessons from this study may offer useful insight on the issue of preference use of public transport by the target people, as well as behavioral insights application in general. Okay. Uh, however, precautions should be taken so as not to, generalize, not to generalize the findings from the study to other sites or target groups. Okay. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Back to you, Mr. Wong. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mariam, for a very insightful um, presentation yeah, and talk. Also, a very detailed study on the using BI approach to study and also to encourage uh, Malaysians, uh, especially those in the Klang Valley, to use the public transport, yeah, especially for those who are working uh, in the city area and uh, their workplace is close to the uh, transit stations. So, uh, doctor, uh, I have uh, two questions here, but they are very closely related. So, uh, I think you can uh, we can combine them and you can answer them. And in fact, yeah. there's also a comment in the chat chat box eh, from another uh, attendee, uh, which is also similar. So, I'll read all three and then you can answer together yeah, to uh, to save some time here also. So, the yeah. first question is from uh, Miss Mageswari Ramaya. The question is. What is the effect of pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on public transport usage among the people? And it is related to another question from uh, Mr. Michael Barcelona, uh, which goes like this. Since there is an ongoing pandemic, what is the best means of transportation that you will suggest to the public? And uh, a comment yeah, uh, by uh, a person called, I think Mr. Lee Kahung, uh, the chat or the, in the chat box, the comment is wonder how we can encourage people to use public transport again under the current pandemic or after eh, post pandemic. So they are all related to COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, correct, correct. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess, oh, thank you very much, uh, Kate, uh, to uh, Megiswari, Mr. Michael, and one more, who, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lee Ka Hong, I think. Uh, Mr. Lee Ka Hong, okay. Uh, I guess uh, all of us are aware, okay, 
how uh, how uh, COVID-19 has badly affected our life. Okay, it is not just in Malaysia, but all around the world. Okay, and in Malaysia, the cases keep on increasing, and day by day, I guess every one of us, uh, some sort of like our stress level, okay, uh, is actually also increased. Okay, with the increase of the case. Okay, and also we uh, we continuously wonder when all this will uh, stop, when all this will end. Okay, and I, I guess everyone, regardless of our political orientation, regardless of our religion, everyone is hoping that uh, they, this pandemic will end soon, okay? So that we can go back to our life, okay? So I can say that since COVID-19 has badly affected all aspects of our life, okay? So as um, the intention or our behavior to use the public transport, Okay, I guess nowadays people are some sort like, say for example, we are the common users of public transport. Okay, before this, before the pandemic, we used to uh, commute using public transport, no problem. And we feel that that is the most efficient way, okay, uh, in Klang Valley. However, due to this pandemic, even though we are so used to use public transport, but we can't, okay, we can't simply because, okay, we know that we are taking actually a major risk of using the public transport, okay? Uh, but I think thanks to the government who, uh, if I'm not mistaken, okay, our government has actually put um, some sort of like uh, taking steps, okay? In order to uh, still ensure that people can use the facility, can you still use uh, the public transport while observing the SOP? Say for example, okay, limiting the number of uh, users, okay, to take the uh, rail, to take the LRT at one particular time. So all those are actually uh, steps, okay, in taking uh, step in making sure that uh, business is still uh, normal, okay, despite okay uh, the problem with the pandemic, okay. Uh, I guess at individual level, we also have to take that kind of precaution, okay? So maybe while the case is uh, still uh, very bad or very varying like this, we have to some sort of like hold on a bit, okay, to that one. Because, well, our health, our safety is, I believe, uh, more important, okay, uh, together with this. But then uh, I believe and hopefully that things will be better for all of us. And so that uh, we will some sort of like uh, set back our intention to use the public transport, okay? So as I said just now, one of our limitation in conducting this study is actually the pandemic. We were also badly affected, okay, by this pandemic because we're some sort of like, Okay, now, okay, before this, we can see that people are using the, the, the public transport, okay, in fact, our team leader, Mr. Go, uh, is the one of, uh, one of the common users of public transport, okay, but then, due to the pandemic, he admittedly mentioned that he has to shift to using the cars, okay, because he can't take the risk, okay, of using the public transport during this pandemic, okay. I guess that's okay, it. thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mariam, for the answer. Um, I don't see any further questions uh, from the viewers or attendees. And also looking at the time, uh, we are now four minutes after 11. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have uh, come to the end of our talk today. Yeah. Um, any closing advice or comment from you to our viewers, uh, Dr. Mariam, before we close the session? Well, just pray and hope that a pandemic will over soon so that we can actually go back to our normal business after this. Okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Okay, thank you. And for those uh, our viewers and participants today, uh, um, you can refer to the uh, chat box uh, um, for the link uh, for evaluation form, yeah, link to the evaluation form of this webinar. And uh, you will also uh, you will also be able to get the certificate of participation mm -hmm. after you have answered 
the uh, evaluation. And also stay tuned um, for our next webinar, which will, uh, which will happen next week. Uh, I think it's Tuesday, uh, but uh, let's wait for the uh, announcement. Uh, and the next webinar will also be on behavioral insight uh, and related to a behavioral insight framework continuation from the previous two webinars on behavioral insight framework. And with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for joining us today, for taking precious time out from your schedule to participate in this webinar. And also I'd like to thank our speaker, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Mariam, for the very interesting and enlightening sharing on the experiment, the study of application of BI in influencing the behavior of Malaysians towards the use of public transport, especially in the Klang Valley, and also especially uh, urban rail transport. So um, I wish everyone here a good day and have a great weekend ahead. Stay safe, healthy, and stay cheerful. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you.